Good to uh, see everybody. Certainly a great day here in Columbia, uh, as it always is. Excited about the group of guys that we've been able to add to our program uh, today. A lot of those guys that we're talking about are already here, which is fantastic. Um, you know, small number of a signing class. We, we knew that going into it. Uh, when you look at our signing class numbers and rankings, yeah, it's small, it's low. That was on purpose. No one talks about when you talk about the signing class and rankings and things like that, the guys that transferred in from other places that are fantastic football players that are going to help this team uh, immediately. So we went into it, talked about it when I got here in December, that it was a signing class that was, that was small back in December. That was intentional allowed us to jump into as I, as I hired this coaching staff, what exactly are our schemes going to be? What's the personnel that we need for those schemes? Who else is out there? Me learning about our current roster here at Carolina and what we needed, uh, which allowed us then to go into the rest of December and all of January and really attack those position needs. And we certainly, uh, certainly did that. Um, we were selective with the guys that we brought into this program. It wasn't just looking at the transfer portal and saying, let's go get the 10 most talented guys or whatever that we could. They had to fit the environment and the culture that we're trying to bring in here. Feel like we have, or they do. Uh, proud of our evaluations. There's a lot of guys here that we're talking about that we offered scholarships to that at the time didn't have a lot of offers. And it's amazing all of a sudden South Carolina offers them an offer, offers them a scholarship. And then there's some other programs that all of a sudden see these guys and figure out they're good enough to be SEC football players. So we're, we're proud of that as well. The evaluation uh, really worked hard over the last couple months to dive into just tons of video, high school prospects, junior college prospects, potential transfers, and finding guys that are fits uh, for us. Got into nine different states, I believe, when you talk about the signees plus some of the transfers that we've added, uh, opening up some new areas for us, potentially from a recruiting standpoint long term, too, which I think will be beneficial for us. I know it will be when you have a university and athletic program like this, uh, you can sell that anywhere. And then with our scholarship situation, we've still got the flexibility to to add some play, uh, add some pieces and, and, and people to the equation going forward if we need to. Obviously, spring practice is going to be big for us uh, to see where we are as a program. Our personnel, you know, that's in the building right now, and, and what we may need, and and have to go attack here going forward in recruiting, and then immediately with uh, uh, some potential guys to add to the roster this upcoming season as well. Hard at work on the class of 2022s. Uh, every single night, we are doing virtual visits with with high school prospects. Uh, we had, I think, four last night and three tonight that we have scheduled with, you know awesome prospects that not the class of 2021, the guys that just signed today, but the guys that are juniors uh, that we're recruiting for next year. We're hard at work on that and really pumped and excited about what we've been able to do in a short period of time since I got here in December. I can't wait to see what we're going to be able to do over the next year as we put together this 2022 uh, signing class and, and all that those guys are going to be able to accomplish and how we continue to build this thing uh, going forward as well. But really pleased with where we are. You know, I'll, we can go through. I'll let you guys ask questions. I'm, I'm not going to go through each and every guy. Uh, we've talked about some of them here in the past, but, you know, I'll be glad to open up questions for you guys now and get to as many of them as I can as we talk about this signing class. David Kloniger with the first one. Hey, Shane. Thanks for doing this. Uh, you mentioned how nobody really mentions how the transfers – figure into this class and its rating. So, I mean, just kind of playing devil's advocate, where do you think this class will be ranked if all the transfer guys' ratings were, were included in it? I think pretty high. I mean, I mean, I don't know about the rankings, but I look at the video and I'm like, man, I mean, you, you watch these guys as, as you're evaluating them and you're deciding whether or not you're going to recruit them. You watch their video, but I went back and just watched all of the video together of all of those guys today. And it, I mean, it's impressive, the group that we've put together. Uh, and every coach stands up here on signing day and talks about, well, we filled our needs, we attacked our needs. And I really feel like we did. I mean, I knew coming in here that some of some immediate needs for us from a depth standpoint was 
we're a wide receiver, linebacker, defensive back, and we we attack that. But when you talk about being able to, you know, add a transfer quarterback that was an honorable mention All American preseason All Conference player, we added a wide receiver that scored 13 touchdowns last season. Added another wide receiver that was his team's leading wide receiver at Georgia Tech in 2019, and tied some of Calvin Johnson's receiving records. A defensive back that uh, has experience at a high-level program like Georgia Southern, uh, an edge rusher in Jordan Strawn that led the nation in sacks, not his conference, not the team, not the university, the nation in sacks. Uh, being able to add a defensive lineman in Joaquin Green that uh, has played at a high level at Nebraska that's a big body on the inside, and then Debo Williams at linebacker that was the player of the year in the state of Delaware coming out of high school. So when you put those guys together, uh, it's an impressive group. So what those rankings may have come out to be, don't know. I know it would be higher than what it is right now, and all, I, all that matters to me is these guys are solid people that are hungry and excited to be at Carolina and can't wait to see what we're going to be able to accomplish together. Reggie Anderson. Hey, Shane, your uh, previous head coach at Oklahoma had a pretty good track record with walk-ons, just your philosophy. And you look at the preferred walk-ons you have coming in there. Anybody who follows high school football in this area, that's a who's who. For sure. It always will be. Uh, I was a walk-on. I mean, I'm, those guys are partial to me. And to me, when you've got some – roster issues, you've had some attrition. One of the greatest ways to build that back up uh, when you don't have scholarships or, or the amount that you like would be that walk-on program. And we have, I've been some programs where it was just kind of like you, whoever showed up and tried out, you know, you might keep a couple and, and that was the walk-on program. I mean, we, we have been active about trying to find guys and, and sell them what a fantastic opportunity this is at Carolina to get an education like this, to play in the SEC, and, and to play at a high level or a great football program. It's on the way up. So certainly that will always be, not just this year, but will always be uh, a critical aspect of this program is being able to get guys in as walk-ons, develop them uh, as players and, and student athletes, and, and, and getting them out there on the field. But the fact that we're able to add some guys to this program that, that turn down uh, opportunities, you know, financial opportunities at other schools to, to walk on here, we couldn't be more excited about those guys. Just a reminder that we can't talk about a lot of those guys at this point. Greg Hadley. Hey, Shane, you talk about making this class maybe deliberately smaller, is that, that being part of the plan. What went into your uh, thought process of, you know, prioritizing maybe the transfer portal, maybe the, uh, instead of high schoolers? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, a lot of it was just timing. I mean, I got here in December. Uh, I, we kept every single player that was committed when I got here in December stayed committed and signed with us, which I think is a great testament to – to those guys that they, you know, that none of them committed to me or, or were, were committed to me. Obviously, when I got here, they were committed to a previous staff. They believe in this university and what this program's about and stayed committed and signed, which uh, I, hats off to them. You know, I'll always be appreciative and, and have so much respect for those guys doing that when some of them, a lot of them had opportunities to go elsewhere. But at that point, I got hired. Signing day was shortly thereafter. I could have gone out in December and just signed 10 more high school players for the heck of it, just to have a nice signing class of 20 signees. It's ranked a little higher and things like that, but I didn't want to do that. For me, it was important to keep those guys committed, take a deep breath, let's get our coaches in here, figure out what exactly fits the systems that we're putting in place from an offense, defense, special team standpoint, and then go recruit to that. And it just happened to be the – uh, transfers were the priority this year because, you know, let's face it, a lot of those high school prospects that were out there, they signed in December. So there were certainly some guys that we had conversations with that I, when I got the job, that we would have loved to have had back in December. When I say some, I mean less than five or so that we, you know, extended offers to that went elsewhere. But at that point, it was take a deep breath, let's figure out where we are, what we need. A lot of if guys had not signed somewhere, guys like uh, Colby Fields, then let's go full speed ahead on them, which is what uh, we did. But frankly, it just worked out that way that the majority of guys that were still out there were guys that were in the, the, the transfer market and were in the transfer portal. So we immediately, anytime guys were, we just dove into them and, and credit to, you know, so many people in this building that had a hand in this, that, that handled our recruitment. I mean, we've got a fantastic 
support staff of people that were already here when I got hired that we've been able to add since I got hired and, and hats off to so many of those guys because they were the ones doing a lot of the legwork and groundwork on guys as they entered the transfer portal, making us as coaches aware and and uh, getting their getting their video in front of us. So we were able to go forward and attack and, and, and develop relationships with those guys. Colin Taylor. Yeah, Shane, you mentioned some of the scholarship and roster flexibility you have. I'm curious now that you enter after signing day, how do you plan to attack that? Are there positions of need, positions of need you'd still like to fill, or is it just trying to find the best guy available? No, I mean I think you're always trying to improve your roster, and and a lot of that I think will depend on spring practice, and and you hope as a program you don't have any more attrition, and, and you keep everybody in place. But you know the fact of the matter is with the, with college football now. That may not be the case, and and so we'll you know take situations as they arise. But um, I think really the the main thing for us right now is just develop this football team that we have, and then after spring practice, if we say you know what we've got to add some more depth at that position, more competition at that position, then we'll certainly attack that. If a just a fantastic football player, regardless of position. Uh, has an interest in coming to South Carolina, then we've got the flexibility to pursue that as well. But having said that, like I'm, I'm could not be more excited about the players in this program right now and the way that they're working. I mean, we've got a really good group of young men that are hungry. Their work ethic is fantastic. I absolutely love coming in this building every single day and being around them and spending time with them and cannot wait for there's a lot of work that has to get done between now and spring practice, but I'm so excited for the start of spring practice, but even more excited for just what, what this environment's like in this facility right now and how much I enjoy coming to this building each and every day and being around our players and, and uh, love the group that we have and, and the way that they're working right now as well. And if, if this is the 2021 South Carolina football team and it does not change at all and we don't add anybody else to it, fantastic. Let's roll and I can't wait to play ball with them. And along those lines, we just got the paperwork in on the last player we were waiting on today. So everything's good. Hollywood. <laughs> All right. Mike Yuva with the next question. Jan, I think naturally, you know, fans, whether it's today's signing day period or you go back to December, you know, they think about the five stars, the four stars and three stars. But for you in particular, it seems like you've focused a lot on the preferred walk-ons, especially the guys here at home. You know, when you think of a guy like Nathan harris Wainick and some of these other guys that you have took on from South Carolina outside of fit and talent, what are some of the other things as a head coach you're looking for in a preferred walk-on? And, you know, how did some of these guys that you did bring to South Carolina, how did that kind of fit the bill? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's guys that want to be at Carolina – for all the right reasons, this the education you get here, the football program, and, and and guys that are hungry to be here. So you're certainly looking for that. I mean, you've got to have a a skill set uh, where you can legitimately play football at the Division One level, uh, at the SEC level. And I feel like these guys that we've got joining our program certainly not feel I know they certainly can. And, and then beyond that, it's just you know the character and, and just the want to. And 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 honestly, uh, Mike, I mean, I saw a lot of that with my dad at Virginia Tech, just guys, I, Cam Chancellor is an example. I mean, Cam didn't walk on, but Cam was a guy I think that Virginia Tech had to beat James Madison for, I think, in recruiting. And, but he was a guy that, that was hungry and got in there with a, an amazing work ethic and turned himself into a player of the year and all pro and all that stuff that Cam was with the Seahawks, just to use that example. But I think there's so many examples here um, of, of, guys that get in here, we're going to develop them. And I think in this state, there's a lot of players like that that maybe fall through the cracks that aren't that are overlooked in the recruiting process for different reasons where you're able to get them in here, develop them and, and then turn them into great players. And, and it's what I want this program to be about the team, us being unselfish. And and I was telling some people last week, I mean, it, one of my favorite uh, graphics or, or things in our indoor is a picture up on the wall over there uh, in our indoor. And it's when we beat Alabama back out back in 2010, they're number one in the country. And I apologize. I've already told you guys this story. I'm going to tell it again if you heard it. Um, but up there's a picture of Trent Richardson, the Alabama running back on the, on the ground after we've tackled him. And then standing over top of him is Stephon Gilmore, Antonio Allen, 
two great defensive players that had NFL, that one still having an NFL career, and Antonio played in the NFL and had a great career as well. But then Blake Baxley, who some of you may not know Blake Baxley, but if you follow Carolina football, was a heck of a walk-on for us, uh, covered kickoffs. And I'm looking at that, I'm like, when was Blake – on the field with Antonio and Stefan, it hit me. That's a kickoff. And we scored. The crowd in williams Bryce Stadium is going berserk. And we kick off, and I can still see it in my head. It's, we're kicking towards the, the, the cockabooses. And Trent Richardson tries to bounce that ball back over to our sideline. And we tackle him inside the 20. And there's Blake Baxley, former walk-on, Stephon Gilmore, Antonio Allen, celebrating along with the other guys on that kickoff team, guys like DJ Swearinger that were pretty good as well. But then just I love that image because it's everything that I want this program to be about, about the unselfishness and the team. And I don't, I couldn't tell you, and this is an honest answer, and I'm sorry to keep rambling, but I don't, I'm trying to learn the roster right now. Scholarship walk on, I don't know. I mean, I got a pretty good idea that Luke Doty's on scholarship. I mean, I'm not being, I'm not that dumb, but, but there's so many guys that I don't know how they got here and really don't care. I mean, everybody in this program is going to be treated the same, and, and uh, the, that walk on program for us is going to be a fantastic resource for us going forward. Hill. Excuse me. You mentioned that in uh, the linebackers and Tavarian Scott and Colby. I was wondering if you could share a couple thoughts on each of those two guys. Yeah, for sure. And, and I'm glad you asked. I mean, that, that's one that, you know, both those guys. So back in December when I talked about us sitting down and kind of figuring out what we need to attack and what we need to address from a personnel standpoint uh, on defense, it was linebackers slash, you know, edge outside backer type guys. And we knew we didn't have a ton of scholarships, so we had to be real selective and exact about who exactly we were gonna go we were gonna pursue. And from day one it was Colby and Bam. And those were the guys that were at the top of Coach White's list and our defensive staff's list. And that's what I'm excited about is we said these are the two guys, we pursued them. Uh, we offered both those guys back in December. You know, Colby was committed to another school at the time and then announced on Twitter that, you know, he was had been offered by South Carolina. And uh, frankly, you worry about a kid all the way out in Louisiana and then bam, all the way halfway across the country, being able to get those guys to Carolina when you have a lot of suitors coming after them. So really impressed that, the, that they were able to, that we identified them early, we went after them early. They stayed with us and ended up signing with us and had a lot of competition for those guys. I mean, I was on the phone with Bam and all of our coaches were, you know, up until last night because uh, you got a lot of people that are coming at them from a lot of different directions that didn't like hearing that they weren't coming to their school and were coming to South Carolina instead. But uh, we've got to have guys at the linebacker position that are big and have the physical traits that we're after, uh, but have a – uh, a mentality to them as well and these guys have that they're hard workers they're all business every time I talk to them they're either working out getting ready to go work out or just finished work out uh, working out all the time and and they're appreciative of this opportunity and and both of them have really really big uh, upsides and exciting to see excited to see what they're going to be able to do in coach White's defense and and uh, once they get in the weight room with, with Coach Day and here in nutrition with Kristen and, and as we continue to develop those guys. John Del Bianco. Could you touch on the other signees too, uh, TJ Sanders, first off? Yeah, uh, you know, TJ's one. It's always going to be important for us to keep the best players in South Carolina at home. And, and uh, TJ's one of those guys that was out, without a doubt is one of the the very best players in, in South Carolina. So we're fortunate that he headed our way, had a great senior season playing in the state championship over there at Marion. I love the fact that at 6'4", 285 pounds, my man averages a double-double on the basketball court, uh, which is <laughs> pretty impressive. Kind of shows his athleticism. But somebody that uh, I know when I got here was was committed to us and immediately watched his video. And when you get a – when you've got a guy with that kind of athleticism that can play on the interior of your defensive line and he's an in-state player and he's a great young man that comes from a winning program, you'll take those guys all day long. You on mute, John. Can you hear me? Yep. And Ladarian Craig, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so obviously hot off the presses on that one. Uh, great length, uh, goes by Hollywood. Um, really 
awesome personality. You guys are going to enjoy uh, getting to know him as well. Another one that, you know, was a fight to the finish with some teams that came in late on him as well. And we were certainly one of them. Let's, let's not – we haven't been on him in forever. Uh, we just got in on him recently. But here in the last 24, 48 hours, he's had a lot of suitors come attack him. But uh, a guy that obviously coming from Alabama – being able to get into that state more and more from recruiting uh, will be great for us uh, and size. In this league, it's all about matchups. I mean, we've got a, what, a six foot seven, six foot eight receiver that just joined the roster. So at the defensive back position, you better be able to match up and have size and physicality at the defensive back position. And, and uh, Hollywood brings that to the table. Six foot two, 175 pounds, best footballs in front of him. Uh, magnetic personality and will be a really, you know, be able to help us from a defensive standpoint. And then all these guys from a special team standpoint as well, as you increase your depth, that only makes your special teams better and better. And he'll certainly have a big role in that also. Bill Cornblut. Uh, hey, Shane. Hey, Phil. Uh, let's see, I was going to ask you. Oh, uh, <laughs> moving forward, is will it be your plan to fill your uh, roster more with high school kids, or do you still want to, uh, as you build future recruiting classes, um, continue to hit the transfer portal and, and junior colleges, number one? Number two, I'm just seeing a, a tweet by um, our own Wes Mitchell that you've hired Monterio Hardesty as running backs coach. Can you comment on that? There is a – we've had great interest in that running back position. When uh, I walked in here, we had a SEC coaching battle brewing in regards to our running back position and, and optimistic about the direction that that's going. So we'll see. Been some fantastic people. I've – um, I've seen different reports out there about what we've supposedly been doing with our running back position, but uh, the first time I offered a job to anyone was this morning, uh, not yesterday or the day before or whatever other different reports are out there about what we're doing. So we'll see what happens, but excited about the, the uh, uh, interest in that running back position. And, and it's important for me to get a guy in here at that running back position. There's some great running back coaches, but I feel for our guys because – uh, our running backs are about to have their third running back coach in less than a year, if I'm not mistaken, and, and that's hard. You, know, you come to college thinking you're going to have the same position coach for hopefully your entire career, and they're about to have their third in a year. Uh, so I feel for those guys. I told them the night that, that, that uh, uh, Coach Kitchings left that we're going to get somebody in here that wants to be here and will be here, and we'll see what happens on that. And then going forward, yeah, we always want to start with the high school ranks. I mean, you don't know what who's going to – who's going to be in the transfer portal. It's not realistic to sit there and say, okay, we got 20 scholarships for the 2022 class. We're going to wait and see who's in the portal come December. I mean, we're, if we could sign uh, our entire class from the high school ranks and then supplement that with junior college players and then potential transfers as well, sure. I mean, we're always going to uh, do what we have to do to add to our roster and improve it and make it better. And, but always we're going to start with the, the, high, school, the high school ranks and, and getting a guy in here that will be here for four years and, and go from there. Colin Taylor. Hey, Shane, I guess two questions for you. First of all, uh, how excited are you to get the NCAA football games back? Do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> Very. Uh, that was pretty cool. Props to Fink and his crew, too, for that uh, tweet yesterday with me on the cover. That was uh, pretty awesome um, as well, or, or whoever, who, anybody else that was responsible for that. My son thinks it's cool. He's at the age where he's getting into Madden, so when he saw that he's, his dad was on a quote-unquote video game cover, he was pretty excited. No, but that's awesome. I can remember playing it. Uh, growing up, uh, the four-bedroom apartment that I lived in when, in college with three football players, that was kind of the epicenter of what we had going on in our apartment each and every day. Uh, Tommy Frazier in Nebraska, I was a big Donovan McNabb and Syracuse guy playing that game back in the day. So to have it, uh, to have it coming back is, uh, is pretty cool and, and uh, looking forward to seeing some Gamecocks on there as well and leading the charge on that. And I guess with – I guess Taylor Edwards now and Drew Hicks, and how excited are you to get them into the program? What's What's been the response in the recruiting trail with them finally being able to be in the fold? Yeah, really good. I mean, just for a lot of different reasons. I mean, Taylor's a guy that I've known for a while. Um, I guess, I, you know, we have a mutual friend and met him at a wedding in Tuscaloosa like 10 years ago or so. 
um, that he was attending as a, as a guest and have just kept in touch with him and love his background, the fact that he's been at Alabama, he's been at, which is fami you know, some fam familiarity with the system I was around at Georgia, putting together great recruiting classes at Maryland, uh, being at UAB, Jacksonville State. He's kind of seen every end of the spectrum. And, uh, and then Drew, Drew and I were together at Georgia. Thought he did a fantastic job when we were on the staff together at Georgia my first two years in Athens. And, and somebody that's brought in his network going to Virginia, then going to Kansas, and then coming back here. He's from Georgia, he and his wife both. So to have them back in this part of the country, it's awesome to have those guys uh, in the building. Just from a you know, organization structure standpoint, it's tough when you don't have that role. Every coach is recruiting, but just somebody that can kind of like keep it all, excuse me, keep it all together and, and manage everything to be able to do that is, is fantastic. And so thankful that uh, our administration has allowed me the resources to, uh, to put together that recruiting staff, like, uh, you know, think it needs to be, needs to be done. And those guys, along with, you know, George Wynn and Jessica Jackson and Justin King and, and, and Zach and their staff and, and all of our amazing student assistants that I talked about before, uh, really fired up about the group that we have here and, and this entire organization and we'll continue to make it better each and every day. Helmut Granahan. Now that you can totally switch gears to 2022 and I guess 23 as well a little bit, how challenging is it going to be to account for all the, the different variables that are in play now with the portal and guys getting the extra year and all that stuff as you try to project ahead with those cycles? No, it's a big challenge. I mean, you're trying to make decisions, but then you're thinking and there's just so many, so many unknowns. I mean, when it comes to your current roster and extra years that are available and who may want to use it, who may not want to use it, you may not know those things or won't know those things and, uh, until later down the road. But certainly it's something that you, you always have your uh, projected roster numbers in mind when it goes into, okay, this is the class of 2022. We're gonna, we're, we plan to sign this number of quarterbacks, this number of running backs, this number of linebackers, defensive backs. And you have that certainly going into the 2022 class uh, for sure, but then you also realize that you better have some flexibility on that because that can certainly change. And, and uh, as your roster changes, and uh, it, it'll be constantly be evolving. So it's, it's different. We're all going through it. I mean, it's something that at Oklahoma, we spent a lot of time talking about as a staff with Lincoln, you know, back during the season about everything going forward. And as an assistant coach, you're like, all right, yeah, whatever. Now you're, now you're the head coach and you're making those decisions and you are in charge of uh, that roster. It's a little bit more daunting, but again, we just kind of initially it was what do we have to do to make the 2021 team the very best it possibly can be, and that's still our priority right now. But then we also know uh, going forward that there's there's got to be some flexibility and that it will be uh, something that hasn't been done before, not just us, but everyone throughout college football as we try and put this thing together. Go back to Phil Cornblue. Yeah, one more quick little follow-up, Shane. So it looks like Alabama has signed the greatest class in the history of college football, according to uh, the websites. And, and Rivals has got 10 SEC teams in the top 25. So from where you sit at South Carolina in your first year and you, you think about trying to move up with those folks, I mean, is it a how daunting a task is it starting it from scratch like you guys are having to do when you're dealing with people like that? Well, I mean, that's... That's the SEC, and there's a reason that so many young men from Washington, D.C., Virginia that are on our roster, North Carolina that are on our roster, uh, so many guys from so many different states, they want to play football at the highest level, and that's the Southeastern Conference, and so many people want to come play in the SEC, and, and part of that is you want to play elite competition, and uh, it was that way when I was here before, probably even more so now because a lot of these programs have elevated uh, their status since I was – here as an assistant coach before, but let's go. I mean, it is what it is. You, you go have a great recruiting class in the SEC, you're probably gonna be top 10 in the country. I was looking at it today. I think four of the, four of the top 10 recruiting classes I saw are guys that are on our schedule like every single year. Uh, that's great. You know, you want to play against the best. I'm, one of the core values of this program is just competition and, and competing in everything that we do. And, and we get a chance to go compete against the very best each and every week. And everything that we're doing as, our, as a program is to 
move this program forward. We're, we're right up there talking about, you know, South Carolina and perennial top 10 recruiting classes and how these other teams in the league are going to have to, uh, how they feel about having to face us each and every season. So it's nothing that uh, I would consider daunting. Is it a challenge? Yeah, absolutely. But we're attacking and working every day to, uh, to go attack that challenge. Jen Del Bianco. You were able to finalize uh, Connor Shaw's role with the program. Um, can you explain a little bit what, what he'll be getting into? I know it said he has some expanded responsibilities and how big was it for him to be able to help in the recruiting in any, in any way he could? Yeah, any way that Connor can help is a is a invaluable tool for us. And, and I've, I think I've told you guys before, the day that I got here back in December, I sat down with Connor, one of the very first guys I met with in my office, and told him that I'm not letting you go anywhere. and and I want you in this building. I want you here with me. And we need to sit down and figure out exactly, you know, where you are with things and, and what your goals are and what you want to get done. And I want to help you get to that. And, and that's what we've done. I mean, Connor's just, I think Connor's brilliant. Uh, he's got a brilliant football mind from playing at, at, at South Carolina and playing in the NFL. I think he's got a brilliant mind when it comes to recruiting, relating to the people, uh, his ideas on just team development and character development. Uh, Connor is going to be doing a little bit of everything and within obviously within NCAA rules, but he's a guy that I rely on a lot, somebody that I bounce a lot of uh, bounce ideas off of and I want his opinion on things and because uh, he's seen it, like I talked about as a player, uh, as a pro. Uh, back in this building uh, in the last year in a support staff role. So uh, really uh, feel it's fantastic that he's here with me and he's a guy whose role will continue to grow and, and he's a guy that's going to have a lot of uh, you know, input on, on the day-to-day -day operations of this building, that's for sure.